It's had its ups and downs, Tag Heuer, and perhaps more recently, the ups have been outnumbered by the downs. There's a positive future on the horizon thanks to the efforts of brand fixer-upper Jean-Claude Beaver, but to look to the future isn't always enough to give us hope. We need to look back to the past as well. If your memory of Tag Heuer only spans 10 years, you'd be forgiven for turning your nose up at the idea of words like innovative, trailblazer and icon being used with regards to the brand. Yes, there have been a number of ultra-exclusive concept pieces like the nutty 1 2,000th of a second micro girder and the even nuttier belt-driven Monaco V4, but these never really reflected the core output of the brand in much the same way that no one is fooled into thinking Renault's road cars share anything with its F1 racer. It's not that anyone thinks Tag Heuer is bad, not at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Tag Heuer has offered a beautiful quality for an entry-level price for a long while. What's a shame is that this attitude falls short of what the brand was really about. In a time where there were quite literally hundreds of watch brands in Switzerland, Tag Heuer made its mark in a prominent and lasting fashion. Unfortunately, that mark has drifted wide of the company itself. Perhaps it would help to call it by the name it was known by back then. Hoyer. In all the ruckus of the quartz crisis, Hoyer was bought out by holding company Techniques d'Avant-Garde, hence the tag part, but before that it was just the family name gracing the dial. And this was a family obsessed with motorsport. You may think this Carrera borrows its name from the legendary Porsche, but the truth is that both watch and car took the name in homage to a Mexican cross-country road race at the same time. Speed was in the blood of then-CEO Jack Hoyer, his friends were racing drivers and his business was motorsport. Hoyer's clocks had found fame gracing the dashboards of rally cars and not the mantelpieces of family homes, and the Carrera intended to keep that tradition very much alive. Jack Hoyer even enlisted F1 driver Joe Siffert to sell his watches to other drivers in the paddock. But the peak of the Carrera came in 1969, when Jack Hoyer gave his racing chronograph a beating heart that could also sustain itself. Project 99, the chronomatic, was that heart, the first chronograph with automatic winding, which Hoyer jointly produced with Breitling, Dubois de Praz and Buren. This twin layer movement, micro rotor automatic on bottom and chronograph module on top, was such a challenge to engineer thin enough that it came 24 years after the first automatic movement, and so proud was Hoyer that it switched the crown from the right to the left as a reminder that it didn't have to be hand wound. But not all of Hoyer's watches were for drivers. Some served operatives who were a little more airborne than that. And so the 1550SG came to be a contracted project for the Bundeswehr, the German Armed Forces. Established in 1955, the Bundeswehr was founded on new principles of defence, naturally demonstrating a clear gulf between itself and its predecessor as Europe's primary defence during the Cold War. Of course, the Bundeswehr has soldiers to equip and needs tools to equip them with. This is where the military contractor comes in, a supplier who constructs equipment to armed forces specification and delivers en masse for issue to troops. In the case of a watch for the pilots of the Bundeswehr, that contractor was Hoyer. Being that military equipment is governed by a public spend, it must appease the following requirements. It must be cheap, it must be fit for purpose, and it must be supplied on time. In the case of Hoyer, it meant none of the usual flourishes, or indeed any flourishes at all, working to a spec laid out very clearly by the Bundeswehr and already set by watchmaker Leonidas, purchased by Hoyer in the 60s, for the Esercito Italiano, the Italian army. The 1550SG needed to be clear, usable and sturdy, and so that's what the Bundeswehr got. More specifically, the watch needed to be a flyback, 
That is, the reset button can be used while the chronograph is running to immediately reset and restart it. It's a Valju calibre doing the work here instead of Hoyer's own non-flyback chronomatic, a cost-saving exercise. Hoyer also complied with the need for the watch to be usable with gloves on, and so it measures at a chunky 42mm, crown and pushers clear of the case and each other enough to use cleanly. The decoration of the dial and bezel is plain but functional, offering high contrast with the benefit of nighttime legibility from the tritium luminous paint for the numbers and on the hands. Being a military issue watch, Hoyer was also required to denote the use of radioactive tritium paint in two ways. The first with the red 3H, an indication of the use of the radioactive isotope of hydrogen, hydrogen 3, plus, for whatever reason, the inclusion of a tiny T just above the 6 o'clock marker. The Monaco is and will continue to be one of the most famous watches Tag Heuer makes, but just seeing the big square watch in a jeweler's window, undoubtedly accompanied by a picture of Steve McQueen, you know the one I mean, does its story a bit of an injustice. I won't go so far as to say the Steve McQueen thing is a myth, but it was for a film based on Heuer ambassador and racing driver Joe Siffert, and Jack Heuer was keen to push his new line of chronomatic equipped watches. Whether it was the Monaco that caught the eye of the property master, whether it was the model Jack Hoy wanted to push most, or whether McQueen picked it himself, it's just a movie. Given that McQueen wore identical racing overalls to Siffert, the watch should have been an Altavia, really. What's more interesting here is the journey that got Hoyer onto the movie set in the first place to culminate in the cult status of this big square watch. As you know, the Hoyer family was invested in motorsport from the very beginning, but there's a big difference between making dashboard clocks for rally cars and providing costume for Steve McQueen. Unlike today, an F1 driver in the 60s wasn't necessarily a jet-set playboy millionaire by default. Jack Hoyer's F1 driver friend Joe Siffert, for example, as well as smoking cigarettes to stave his hunger when he didn't have enough money to buy food, had a side business as a Porsche dealer hassling Jack into buying a 911 in exchange for representation on the Formula One grid. Siffert was so good at pushing Jack's watches that soon every driver on the grid was wearing one. What happened next would change the face of Formula One forever. Jack arranged a deal with Joe to have the Hoyer name on his racing overalls and then his car, a first for motorsport sponsorship outside of motorsport brands. This opened the floodgates for marketing in Formula One, leading to some of the greatest racing liveries the world has ever seen. So, when director Lee Katzen decided he wanted an altogether authentic look for his 1971 film Le Mans, it was to none other than 1966 and 67 Le Mans winner Joe Siffert that he turned to. Siffert's charm and style had earned him a reputation, one that was music to Katzen's and McQueen's ears. He was the perfect hero, and with him came Hoyer. The result was a perfect storm of iconography. Steve McQueen, the Golf liveried Porsche 917, and, of course, the Hoyer Monaco. Three watches, three snapshots of history from a watchmaker that's somewhat lost its spotlight in recent years. From the domination of the racetrack to the conquest of the skies, Hoyer watches may have gained an acronym since the glory days, but that can never erase what came before it. Here's hoping that what comes after can live up to the name. Discover more exceptional watches at watchfinder.co.uk If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If there are any other watches you'd like to see reviewed, please let us know in the comments below.